I'll reveal the hidden secrets behind the best introductions for research papers for Q1 journals that top researchers use and show you in-depth examples from research papers published in Q1 journal. And this will work regardless of your field. So the first element of an outstanding introduction to a research paper for a Q1 journal is to establish the importance of the topic and define any key concepts. So let's look at how this is done on a real example of a paper published in a Q1 journal. In this case is the journal Limnology and Oceanography, which is one of the most respected journals in this particular field. And that paper was published by one of our clients on the published researcher program. So straight away in this paragraph, we've got the definition of the topic. The topic is introduced and then defined. And then what the researcher does as well in here very well is to straight away point out the problem, meaning that we don't understand very well this particular topic despite all the research. And this is one way to point out the importance of the topic as an important unresolved problem. Now, there are also other ways in which you can introduce the topic and point out its importance. Here's another paper, this time on microplastics published in sensors and actuators at physical which is also a q1 journal and this was also published by one of our clients on published research program so in here what we've got is the importance of the topic for the society as a whole for the world as a whole and this is not going to work for every single topic but something like plastics or microplastics works really well right so every year plastic production has increased to meet the demands of various industries and consumers and over time most plastic end up as debris that is often mismanaged and so on right so we've got the importance of the topic is framed for the society in general and then also very quickly as an unresolved problem that we need to tackle because then later on we get to pollution one thing to notice here which i think is really important is how it goes from general to specific it doesn't just say that plastic pollution has reached most remote regions because that would be too abrupt we first talk about plastic production and the increase in it and then that most plastic plastic end up in debris and therefore we have plastic pollution. To give you one last example, you can also frame the importance of the topic in terms of its importance for your particular discipline. And this is exactly what this paper does published in long range planning, which is a Q1 journal in business and management. And in here, the topic of corporate purpose has rapidly gained traction within management and organizational literature. That quickly establishes that this is an important topic for the discipline that we should study. And then later on, we have a definition of that topic. So remember, in the first paragraph of your introduction, establish the importance of the topic and define any key concepts. Now, what's the second element of a really outstanding introduction for a research paper for a Q1 journal? That will be a brief literature review. And I want to stress the word brief here because you don't have a thousand or two thousand words in order to review the literature. It should be as brief as possible. One, two, maximum three paragraphs in the introduction. And what you want to do is just review the one to three key topics really connected to your research question. So if we look at this paper on microplastics, we've got the literature review done in two paragraphs, the one starting with diverse analytical methods and then surface plasmon resonance. Now, notice again that it's really nicely developed from general to, to specific. We can't talk about this specific method before we talk about overall what analytical methods have been employed by previous researchers in order to, find, for example, analyze microplastics and what has worked and what has not worked about these specific methods. So you always want to go from general to specific. And there are different ways in which you can organize the literature review in your introduction, depending on your aim. In here, for example, it's organized by the methods that have previously been used to study this topic. Why? Because this study proposes a new method to study that topic. So it just makes sense to organize everything around the methods previously used. On the other hand, in here, the literature review is organized around the topics that previous research has focused on. Why? Because this study identifies a gap, a lack of understanding and insufficient research on a particular sub topic that hasn't been done. Therefore, it really makes sense to organize it by topic. So in here, in the second paragraph, you can see that studies focusing on this, focused on this specific issue. 
And then it straight away really nicely points out some gaps in our knowledge and some lack of research, which we're going to get into a second, but it's already hinted upon in the literature review. And just like in the, in the previous paper, this um, literature review is very brief. In here, it takes three paragraphs rather than two. But a really important thing is to go from general to specific, only focus on the key important topic and make sure that one paragraph is about one key topic. So for example, notice that in this paragraph, we've got a clear topic sentence that tells us straight away what the topic of the literature review in this particular paragraph is going to be. And then that topic is further developed in the following sentences, again, going from general to more specific, for instance, and then another subtopic is introduced and then it goes more specific. Now, once you've reviewed the literature, it's really important now to point out the research gap. The research gap is really the raison d'etre of your paper. It's your reason for being. Otherwise, you don't have a paper if you don't have a research gap. And there are four types of research gap. There can be insufficient studies, previous studies can be limited, there can be an unresolved problem that needs resolving, and there can be a lack of consensus on previous literature. And ideally, you want to combine more than one research gap. And we've got that here. In this specific case, it's a lack of understanding or a lack of consensus because our understanding on how the composition of the phytoplankton community during winter to spring transition impacts da 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 remains limited. But the point is that our knowledge is limited. And then we've got the aim of the study, which I'm going to get to in a second. A very similar thing is done here. We've got the literature review and then scholars point to the depth of understanding, particularly regarding this. And then apart from a lack of understanding, we also point out problems with previous studies or limitations of previous studies. While certain frameworks exist, there are limited in certain ways. So in here, we've got a nice combination of more than one research gap. And then similarly here, we talk about a lack of studies and a practical problem that needs resolving. So again, we've got two different research gaps combined. So to recap, once you've reviewed your literature, you need to point out the gap in knowledge really quickly. And then we move to the aim. And very often the aim is just one sentence. However, there are also some papers in which after the aim, you also state the methods and what you did step by step. And this is a good example in this paper because we've got the aim of the paper here. And then in the following sentences, the writer presents what they did step by step to achieve that aim. And this is very typical of papers in exact sciences, especially where the methods are perhaps a little bit more complicated. Now, a slightly different way of presenting the aim can be seen in this paper because we've got the aim here and then we've got a justification why the writer focused on this specific geographical area and not someplace else. So this is really useful if the location of your study has a lot of importance for the results and it could be questioned, I suppose, by reviewers. So that's why you want to add that justification. And then we've got a hypothesis as well and a much more specific aim. So rather than just a general aim, what the writer does here is to already indicate what the potential outcomes or contributions of this research might be in order to show us kind of what's the point of this whole research anyway. Now, once you've presented the aim, an optional element that I would encourage you actually to include is the results or the contributions of your study. This might seem weird because typically the results are presented later on in the paper and the contributions usually come in the conclusion. But I learned it this the hard way and that's why I recommend you implement it at the end of your introduction. Because one time I submitted a paper to a really top Q1 journal in my field and the paper came back with major, major revisions. And I was really down about it because I thought I had a really good paper. And as I started reading it, it became clear to me that the reviewers could not see the novelty of my study. And I was shocked. I kind of thought, well, but it is very novel. How come you can't see it? Have you even read the paper? And then the more I thought about it, I said to myself, well, why don't I just really clearly at the end of the introduction point out the main contributions of my study? And that's what I did. And it was a really simple solution. And in the next round of reviews, I got zero comments. And the reviewers were very positive, very happy with the changes, and the paper got published. 
And you can see that top researchers who publish in Q1 journals actually do that quite regularly as well. For example, in this paper published in Long Range Planning, the last paragraph is about the results and about how these results in this specific case make a theoretical contribution to the field. Now, your contribution doesn't have to be theoretical. It can also be practical. You can make suggestions for future research. It really doesn't matter. But what you want to do is briefly state the key main result of your study and how it contributes. And the same thing is done in this paper published in a Q1 journal. Our findings confirmed X, Y, and Z, and there is the contribution of the paper right here as well. And the same thing is done here. Our findings can contribute to the extension of ta da da. So you see, all of these papers do that. I think you should really do that to showcase the novelty of your research at the end of the introduction. Because one of the top reasons why papers get rejected is insufficient contribution to the field. So you want to make that crystal clear to the reviewers next time you're writing a paper. So now that you have an outstanding introduction to a research paper for a Q1 journal, you might want to know how to write the methodology. So in this next video, there is a fast and easy way to write an outstanding methodology section for your next paper. And you will see how I give live feedback to another researcher on her methodology section.